the second line of logical evidence showing us that the Bible really did come from God is that Jesus says so. But again, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to his. Matthew 4, 1-11 Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you were the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you were the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. So here's the question. How do we know that the Bible really did come from God? Well, what do we just see? Jesus not only quoted the scripture to combat Satan himself, but he did so because he obviously believed that it carried the ultimate authority, and that's exactly what we saw. Even the devil has to obey what the Bible says. Why? Because it really did come from God. And believe it or not, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what Jesus taught about the Bible. Let's take a look at some others. He gave it divine authority in Matthew 4, verses 4 through 10. Indestructibility in Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Infallibility in John chapter 10, 35. Ultimate supremacy, Matthew 15, 3 and 6. Factual inerrancy, Matthew 22, 29. Historical reliability, Matthew 12, 40. And scientific accuracy, Matthew 19, 4 through 5. In other words, Jesus believed in a literal Adam with a literal Eve in a literal garden where the first woman literally ate the first man out of literal house and home. <laughs> and apparently, uh, if you haven't heard, that's why uh, uh, what Adam got for trying to cut a deal with God. Uh, one day Adam was moping around the Garden of Eden, so it goes, and, and he was feeling very lonesome. And so, so God asked him, well, what's wrong, Adam? And Adam answered that he didn't have anybody to talk to. So God said he was going to give him a companion and that this companion would be a woman. And he said that this woman would cook for you and, and wash your clothes and always agree with every decision you make. And she will bear your offspring and never ask you to get up in the middle of the night with them. And she will not nag. And she will always be the first to admit that she was wrong in a disagreement. She'll never uh, have a headache. And she will freely give you love and compassion. And Adam asked God, well, what, what's a woman like this going to cost? And God said, an arm and a leg. And Adam said, well, what can I get for a rib? Yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> but seriously, what we see in the Bible is that Jesus clearly believed in a literal Adam and a literal Eve with a literal creation that happened in literal 24-hour periods. Why? Because the Bible really came from God. That's what Jesus believed, and that's what he taught. And so here's the point. If Jesus is the Son of God, then logically that means that the Bible is the Word of God. Why? Because the authority of Jesus confirms the authority of the Bible. Or as one guy puts it this way, if Jesus is the Son of God, then the Bible is the Word of God. Only if one rejects the divine authority of Christ can he consistently reject the divine authority of the Scripture. If Jesus is telling the truth, then it is true that the Bible is God's Word. And even if you wanted to say Jesus were merely a prophet, then the Bible still is confirmed to be the Word of God through His prophetic office. In other words, you can't have it both ways. You can't agree with some of Jesus' teaching and then turn around and deny the authenticity of the Bible because Jesus clearly presented the Bible as the genuine Word of God, and anything short of this is hypocrisy. And yet, that's exactly what the skeptics do. They not only deny the fact that Jesus clearly taught the Bible really did come from God, but they even go so far as to denigrate Him and the other clear evidences that He was who He said He was, i.e. the Son of God. And therefore, you might want to listen to Him and what He says, including that the Bible came from God. The first thing the skeptics try to denigrate about Jesus is the historicity of Jesus. And here's what they do. 
they'll typically say something like this. Oh, well, come on. This is a bunch of baloney anyway. I mean, Jesus didn't even exist. He only appears in the Bible that men uh, made up to brainwash people with, right? How many of you guys have heard that one before? Yeah, it's all over the place, unfortunately. So, so let's put that charge to the test, though. If Jesus really existed, then, then yeah, you'd think we'd find some other evidence of him outside the Bible, right? Well, guess what? We do. In fact, it's all over the place. Let me give you just a few examples that are out there. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote, Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, Latin for Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Pliny the Younger, a Roman governor of Asia Minor, wrote in A.D. 112 for advice on how to conduct legal proceedings against those accused of being Christians. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God, and bound themselves by a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they have been called upon to deliver it up. After which is was their custom to separate, and then reassemble to partake of food. Josephus, a first-century Jewish historian, wrote about Jesus. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared even to this day. The Babylonian Talmud, a collection of Jewish rabbinical writings compiled between 70 A.D. onward states, On the eve of Passover, Yeshu, Yeshu is the Hebrew for Jesus, was hanged. Hanged is also a synonym for crucifixion. For forty days before the execution took place, a herald cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Lucian of Samosata, a second century Greek satirist, said, The Christians worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers. From the moment they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Suetonius, another Roman historian from A.D. 69 to 140, said this about the Christian persecution of Nero in A.D. 64. He banished from Rome all the Jews who were continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Crestus. Punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. Thallus, another historian who lived in the middle of the first century A.D., wrote, around 52 A.D., about the darkness that fell during the crucifixion of Jesus, as was quoted later by Julius Africanus. On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. In fact, that's not all. There are at least 42 different authors that mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. Now contrast this to the only 10 authors that mention Tiberius Caesar within 150 years of his life, who was the Roman emperor during Jesus' ministry, and yet nobody questions him? Why not? I mean, if you're going to question Jesus with his 42 authors, then why aren't you questioning this guy with his 10? You can't have it both ways. Jesus not only appears in the Bible all over the place, but he appears all over the place outside the Bible. Why? Because he's historically real. Therefore, I think the point is obvious. If Jesus not only says he was the Son of God in the Bible, and he's real, and if even secular sources confirm his existence, then I'm kind of thinking we might want to listen to what he says. How about you? Including the fact that the Bible came from God, right? The second thing the skeptics try to denigrate about Jesus is the uniqueness of Jesus. And here's what's funny and hypocritical at the same time. 
Although the skeptics will flat out deny and refuse to believe that Jesus was God in the flesh and that he's the Savior of the world, even though that's what we see in the Bible, they will nonetheless label him as a good teacher. How many of you guys heard that before? You know, like, like, like Buddha or Muhammad or Confucius, okay? How many of you guys, again, have heard that one before? It's, yeah, it's unfortunately all over the place, isn't it? But the problem is this good teacher mentality is ridiculous when you actually read the Bible. I say that because if you actually read the Bible, you'll see that Jesus did not leave us with the option of him being merely a good teacher. Either he was a liar, which isn't consistent with his character we see in the Bible, or some form of a lunatic, which again isn't consistent with his character, or he was indeed who he said he was, i.e. Lord God. And that's what you get if you actually read the Bible. But nonetheless, let's meet the skeptic on their terms and see just what it is that made Jesus so unique and unlike those other guys, Mo, Larry, and Curly, so to speak. The first unique thing we see about Jesus is that he was a miracle worker. You tell me which one of these guys, Mo, Larry, and Curly, I mean uh, uh, Buddha, Muhammad, or Confucius, ever did stuff like this. Let's take a look. Jesus converted water into wine. He healed the nobleman's son. An amazing catch of fish. He heals the demoniac. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He cleanses the leper. He heals the paralyzed man. He heals the immobile man. He restored the withered hand. He restored the centurion servant. He raises the widow's son to life. He stills the storm. He throws demons out of two men. He raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead. He cures the woman with the issue of blood. He restores two blind men to sight. He walks upon Lake Galilee. He heals the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. He feeds more than 4,000 people. He restores the deaf mute man. He restores another blind man. He heals an epileptic boy. He pays the temple tax by getting money from a fish's mouth. He restores 10 lepers to wholeness. He opens the eyes of a man born blind. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He heals the woman with the spirit of infirmity. He cures a man with dropsy. He restores the sight to two blind men near Jericho. He condemns a fig tree. He heals the ear of Malchus that was chopped off. And then he has an amazing second catch of fish. Now here's the point. Did Buddha ever do those miracles? No. Did Confucius even do those things? I don't think so. How about Muhammad? No. Then how in the world can you say they're all the same and that Jesus was just like those other guys? Folks, it's ludicrous. Jesus is totally unique. The second unique thing we see about Jesus is that he was God. John 20, 26 through 28. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, I think it's pretty obvious, but Thomas not only said Jesus was Lord, but he's who? He's God, right? And so here's the point. Is Buddha God? No. Is Confucius God? No. How about Muhammad? I don't think so. Then again, how can you say they're all the same as Jesus? It's crazy. He's totally unique. The third unique thing we see about Jesus is that he was the Creator. Colossians 1, 15 through 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. That means Jesus. So once again, here's the point. Did Buddha create the world? No. How about Confucius? No. How about Muhammad? Absolutely not. Then how can you say they're all the same as Jesus when he is radically different than all the rest? He is totally unique, unlike those other guys, Mo, Larry, and Curly again. And that's why one man said this. People often ask, what is so unique about Jesus? I mean, he possessed no certificates or degrees. He never traveled farther than 150 miles from where he was born. He lived and moved among common people, and he was not an author. He wrote no books, he composed no poems, he compiled no documents, and the only sentence he wrote was a single line in the sand, which disappeared the same day. 
He never used a fountain pen or even a typewriter or even Microsoft Word, and we have no line or syllable from his hand. And yet, do you realize that more books have been written about him and his words than any other man in history? Do you realize that he has affected the lives of more people than all the authors of all the ages put together, and that the story of his life has now been translated in over 2,500 different languages and is read every year by billions of people? No one ever spoke like this man. His discourses have become the theme of millions of addresses, and his words are simple and clear. In fact, today, his sayings are hammered into polished marble, chiseled into imperishable granite, wrought into enduring bronze, and fashioned onto stained glass windows. His words are literary gems. He stands today unequaled over all of literature. Shakespeare, Milton, Emerson, all bow their heads in his presence, recognizing the superior. He was not a poet, and yet he has inspired thousands of poets to honor their most sublime expressions. He was not a musician, and yet he inspired Mozart, Schubert, Beethoven, Mandelson, Handel, and the list goes on and on. He was not an artist, sculptor, or painter, yet He was the inspiration for Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Hoffman, and so many more. He was not a doctor, and yet he healed the sick, opened blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, and even raised the dead. He was not a statesman, and never held nor aspired to a position. But he founded a kingdom, and he became the conqueror of the world. And in just three short years of Christ's ministry here on earth, it has done more to regenerate mankind than any other influence that has ever been felt in the history of mankind. That's why it remains true to this day that no single word grips the hearts of men like the name of Jesus Christ. There's just something about that name. Why? Because he really existed and he really said that the Bible came from God and you might want to listen to him. The third light of evidence showing us that the Bible really did come from God is that the apostles say so. And this is yet another very important factor, because although we may not know everything about the apostles, we can deduce some things about them from the Bible and what they experienced. When you actually read the Bible, it's very obvious that the apostles truly believed that the Bible came from God, including what they were writing down for us, which was to become the New Testament. But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to theirs. 2 Peter 1, 16, 18, 19, 20 to 21. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it. Above all, You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So here we see that the apostles did not just whoop up some book like the skeptics want to say, but they were actually eyewitnesses of God. And when they went about to preserve this account for us, it was guided along by the Holy Spirit, right? In fact, the Greek word there for carried along spoke of a ship that was being driven or carried along by the wind. And this is the picture of how true biblical inspiration took place. Just as men uh, in a boat have the freedom to move around in the boat, even though the boat is actually being controlled by the wind, so it is with the process of biblical inspiration. The writers of the Bible had the freedom to express their own personality and writing style, but the process was being watched over or controlled or carried along by the wind, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. And this is radically different than other supposed sources of truth and their methods of inspiration. You tell me if it's not wise to stick to the biblical method of inspiration. Not like the Oracle of Delphi. For many centuries, people went to this supposed source of prophetic truth, and it all started one day when a goat herder noticed his sheep acting strange after they peered into a particular chasm. It turned out that the chasm had a gaseous vapor that was being released from it, and it caused the sheep to act agitated and become frantic. 
But soon they weren't the only ones. The next thing you know, somebody actually set up a tripod over it, where these brain-altering vapors from a crack in the ground were now said to have caused a divine source of inspiration. And thus you have the birth of the so-called prophet or oracle of Delphi. Not like automatic writing. This is the occult process by which a writer is taken over by a spirit, who then causes the writer to write down words on a piece of paper without the use of their will, that the writer is clueless to. Not like channeling messages. This is what we saw before where a person is not just taken over by another spirit to write down words on paper, but they actually take over their voice box and speak through them like these people. This man channels a spirit calling itself Bashar, who seems to hold his audience spellbound as he tells them they are equal to the creator of the universe. That you are all made in the image of the infinite creator, and what that means is you are all infinite creators. We thank you. Jack Purcell has become one of the more popular channels possessed by a spirit named Lazarus. Oh, right, fine. <clears throat> well, indeed, a pleasure to be talking with you, and, uh, well, shall we begin where you'd like to begin? Lazarus tells the listener that God is already within man, and that if man wants to find God, he needs only to find himself. Jane Roberts was a New Age pioneer who channeled a spirit known as Seth. Roberts sold more than a million copies of her books and inspired many. Some may find it interesting that the name Seth is synonymous with the Egyptian god, Set. And in the realm of the occult, Set is one of the infernal names of Satan. Not like Mormonism. Believe it or not, it is well documented that Joseph Smith used occult techniques to get his new and improved supposed revelation of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith was a sorcerer and practiced crystal ball gazing, or fortune telling, and was convicted of this practice by the New York courts. Smith's practices of magic and necromancy led him annually during a witchcraft holy day to the Hill Camorra in New York specifically to seek encounters with a spirit being called Moroni. During this time he would attempt to conjure up the spirit from the dead. There is strong evidence that in 1824 Joseph Smith actually had to dig up the body of his dead brother Alvin and bring part of that body with him to the Hill Camorra in order to gain access to the gold plates on which were written the Book of Mormon. It was also known within his community that Joseph Smith used blood sacrifices in his magic rituals to find hidden treasure. C.R. Stafford writes, Joe Smith the prophet told my uncle William Stafford he wanted a fat black sheep. He said he wanted to cut its throat and make it walk in a circle three times around. After his death, Smith was found to be carrying a magic talisman on his person, sacred to Jupiter, designed to bring him wealth, power, and success in seducing women. Behind me is the Los Angeles Temple of the Mormon Church, and inside are many devout Mormons who are fulfilling what they consider to be godly, noble obligations to their faith and to their God. What they don't realize, though, is that the rituals and the ceremonies that they are involved in are straight out of the occult. How do I know that? Because I was a Mormon who went to the temple. I attended the temple many times, but more importantly, I was also a high priest of Satan. Before I joined the Mormon church, I had 12 years of experience in witchcraft and Satanism. And when I went to the temple, I was astounded at the high level of similarity. The handshakes and the grips involved the, the secret tokens of the Aaronic Priesthood and the Melchizedek Priesthood are in fact right out of witchcraft and Satanism. The concept of, of putting on as part of your priesthood robes an apron which God rejected in the Garden of Eden. Lucifer himself in the temple says, this apron is a symbol of my power and priesthood. So when I went through the temple, I was ultimately very satisfied by it because I thought this was in fact, a profound satanic initiation ceremony. 
all throughout the temple grounds here in Salt Lake City, you will find all sorts of occult symbols, symbols that are generally associated with witchcraft and Satanism. They are predominantly on the temple, but they're also on such buildings as the uh, assembly hall, and you can even find them in the visitor center. I mean, the, the place is virtually a Disneyland of occult symbols, and yet there is absolutely no Christian symbol anywhere in here. Hmm, I wonder why. Maybe it has to do with their method of so-called inspiration. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking I'm just going to stick with the biblical method of inspiration over those guys who were involved with the occult, infested with demons, and, and sucked up gas to get a so-called vision. How about you? <laughs> but that's not all. So much so were the apostles convinced that what they were writing really was from God, not gas or demons, that they even said their writings were to be considered from God and included in the Bible. 2 Peter 3, 15-16 Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do other scriptures, to their own destruction. Did you catch it? The Apostle Peter called the Apostle Paul's writings Scripture. And for those of you who don't know, the word Scripture here is actually a technical term that was used to speak of specialized writings that had the authority of God and were considered to be the actual Word of God. And, and that's not the only one. Paul even quoted from the Gospel of Luke, and he too places that on the same level as the rest of Scripture in 1 Timothy 5.18. And so logically, if Paul and Luke's writing were to be considered sacred Scripture, part of the Bible, by other apostles while they were still alive, then logically the other apostles and their writings should be considered sacred Scripture as well, right? In fact, so much so were they convinced of this that they wrote what they wrote really did come from God, that we have a harsh warning in the last book of the Bible by the Apostle John that no one should ever even dare tamper with the words they recorded for us in the Bible. Revelation 22, 18-19 I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. In other words, don't touch it. <laughs> I'd say the apostles seriously believe that what they were writing really did come from God, and you better not mess with it. How about you? And what you need to realize is that this warning is not applicable to just the book of Revelation, as some people would say. I mean, that's ludicrous. Think about it. If it only applied to the book of Revelation alone, which is a part of the Bible, then does that mean you can go ahead and manipulate and mess up the rest of the Bible? That's crazy. Or could it be that since the book of Revelation is just one of the 66 books of the whole Bible, and it just so happens to be at the end of the Bible, then maybe it applies to all the Bible? Wouldn't that be logical? Why? Because it came from God, and the apostles said, you better not mess with it. But that's not all. They were even willing to seal this belief with their very own lives. Let's take a look at what happened to the apostles. James, brother of John, was beheaded. Thomas was run through the body with a lance. Simon, brother of Jude, was crucified in Egypt. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Mark, he was burned and buried after being dragged through the streets. Bartholomew was beaten, skinned alive crucified, then beheaded. Andrew was crucified. Matthew was killed by a spear. Philip was stoned and then crucified. James was thrown off the temple and then clubbed to death. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree. Jude was shot to death by arrows. Matthias was first stoned, then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, but survived and later died a natural death. Now here's my point. If the Bible really were a lie, do you really think that every one of those apostles would die a horrible death like that? 
I mean, I mean, you think if it really was a lie that somewhere, somehow along the line that some of them would have cracked and said something like, okay, 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 you got me. I, I, I was just kidding. Sorry about that. Whatever you do, don't crucify me. Don't drag me through the streets and, and please don't chop off my head or skin me alive. It was a lie. But that's not what we see. Every single one of them died a horrible death, save John, who was tortured, by the way. Why? Because they really believe that the Bible, including what they were writing for us, came from God. And contrast this to Joseph Smith, who, although the Mormons would love to make him out to be a hero or some sort of a martyr like the apostles, he's not. When called upon to stand up for his supposed new New Testament, the Book of Mormon, he was fleeing like a coward running for his life. He was shot and killed by a mob of about 200 men for sleeping with their wives. And he was shot in the back twice while trying to jump out of a window. And yet, we see every one of the apostles of the real New Testament stood the test. Why? Because what they wrote for us really did come from God. And this is why you can't have it both ways. You can't agree with some of the apostles' teaching and then turn around and deny the authenticity of the Bible. Why? Because the apostles clearly presented the Bible as the genuine Word of God. And anything short of this is total hypocrisy. And so it is with the skeptics of the Bible. They spout off these bold claims that the Bible cannot be trusted. It's, it's, a, it's a book full of errors. And yet it is they who refuse to look at the evidence. People be encouraged today. You don't have to give in to the attacks of the skeptic. You don't have to give in to doubt. What we hold in our hands is the genuine Word of God. And that's why, more than ever, again, we have got to wake up and realize the golden opportunity that God has given to us. Our world is in a frantic search for purpose and direction and meaning to life. People are full of questions like, why do I exist? Where did I come from? Where, where is all this evil coming from? And, and is there life after death? And frankly, is there any hope? And it's high time that we, the church, get busy not just saying the Bible came from God, but showing the world that it did come from God. Why? Because even if you have to read this book with your toe, it's the source of truth that tells us how God is not only real, but He really can make a beauty out of ashes with your life, like He did for this guy. I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I read John 9 at age 15, where a man was coming through a village, and a man, um, this, this blind man from birth, Jesus saw him. People said, why was this man born that way? Jesus said it was done so that the works of God may be revealed through him. And in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, it says, All scripture is God breathed. And I believe God breathed in me life and faith. This faith came over me. This peace came over me. And I felt like God answered my question. And what Lord, was the question and what was the answer? The question was why? Why did you make me this way? And the answer was, do you trust me? That's the question. And when you say yes to that question, nothing else matters. And it was in Jesus Christ where Nick found the strength to do what many thought would be the impossible. And I thank God that He didn't answer my prayer when I was begging Him for arms and legs at age 8. Because guess what? Because I have no arms and no legs, He's using me all around the world. And we've seen so far, approximately, uh, this is conservative, 200,000 souls come to Jesus Christ for the very first time in the last six, seven years. And what would you rather? Would you rather have arms and legs, Nick, here on earth and no arms? No. Whatever His will is because I'd rather have no arms, no legs temporarily here on earth 
to be able to reach someone else for Jesus Christ. He read the Bible with his toe, or what little he had left, and what happened? He found out that God really can make beauty out of ashes no matter what. That's what our world needs to see if we'd only read it with our hands as well. Well, hi, this is Billy Crone of Get Life Ministries, and I hope you were blessed with this study. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple things that the Bible says. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the wages of our sin or unholiness is death? In other words, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and be separated from God for all eternity. This is the great cosmic dilemma. God who is holy and we are not, how can we have a relationship with Him? The two will never mix. Now, to make matters worse, we don't even want to admit this, even though God already knows He's God. And so God, out of love, gave us something called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were not something to just memorize or stick on your wall or give the appearance of being a religious person. The Ten Commandments were God's divine x-ray, if you will, into our heart and soul to reveal this truth that we need to admit. And that is this, that God is holy and that we are not. We are disqualified for heaven. So let's take a look at that divine x-ray that God's trying to get us to realize. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the ninth one says, You shall not bear false witness. That's lying. Okay? How many guys have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Okay? Well, if you didn't raise your hand, you just did. You just told a lie because we've all done that. Well, that makes us a liar. The, another Ten Commandments says that you shall not steal. Don't ever take anything without permission. How many of you guys uh, have ever done that? Well, you guys already said you're a bunch of liars. All of our hands should have went up on that one. And for being honest, God already knows. Folks, we've all taken something. We've stolen something, right? That makes us a thief. Another Ten Commandments says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. He's not just holy. Even His name is holy. Hey, folks, let's be honest. If you can believe it, even the name of Jesus Christ uh, has been turned into a common cuss word. Well, the Bible says that's a sin of blasphemy. Now we're a, a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus said, here's His standard. Uh, uh, even if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you committed adultery in your heart. Wow, so now we're an adulterer. The Bible says you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, at least I haven't done that one. Really? Again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred, wishing somebody was dead, okay, that, that's the same thing. Uh, it's akin to the sin of murder. It's just you pulled the trigger in your heart, but God sees the heart. Hey, folks, that's just five out of ten. How are you doing? You still think you're going to get to heaven? On your own? You still think that you're qualified, that you're holy like God, and you could bridge the gap and have a relationship with Him forever? I don't think so. I mean, what did we just see? You're going to stand before God, and so am I. We all are. And we're going to have to give an account for who we are. Hey, hey, God, let me in. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a liar. I, I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. And the Scripture is very clear, folks. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're in trouble. But folks, here's the good news. The Bible says that if we would just admit that, that's the first step, to admit that God is holy, that I'm not, I'm disqualified for heaven, I need a Savior. If we would admit that and then ask for the Savior to save us. That, that's what God was doing with Jesus. God gave us His Son, Jesus Christ. He took the death penalty in our place so that we could be completely forgiven of everything we've ever done and be made holy through Jesus, so that we can now have a relationship with God, both here and now and forever in heaven. We can become qualified. The word that the Bible uses is a word called pardon, that God is willing to pardon us of all of our sins and crimes that we've committed against Him and disqualified us, that disqualified us for heaven, right? And we've actually seen this work in real life. Uh, for instance, uh, there's been people who have committed crimes, gone to court, the gavel's been passed. The judges said, hey, listen, we all know you're guilty. Uh, you even admit you're guilty. And uh, for your crimes, you're going to not just jail, you're going to uh, await in jail to go to the death penalty. And did you know that there actually is a way that somebody could get off of death row? It's called a pardon. The one in the authority, the governor, can grant what's called a pardon for that person's crimes, and they literally can go free. 
Not because of something they did, because the deeds are already done. You can't undo it. Not because of they tried to clean up their act while they were stuck in the jail cell, because that doesn't change anything. But simply out of mercy, the person who has the authority can give them a pardon and they can go free. And did you know it's actually on historical record that there have been people who have been granted a pardon from the death penalty and they've refused to take it. And so even though the offer was there to be set free, they themselves still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, in a nutshell, that's what God's doing every single day with all of us this side of heaven. While you still have breath, you still have an opportunity to receive God's pardon. He's willing to forgive you of all your sins if you would just receive His pardon through Jesus Christ. Again, that's what He was doing on the cross. The cross was the death penalty of the day. But since we weren't there, and since we can't earn it, it's a gift from God, you have to receive that by faith. Reach out even today from your own spiritual jail cell, if you will, and say yes to Jesus and God's pardon so that you can be set free and go to heaven. The Bible says that if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the grave, you will be saved. Hey folks, if that's you, don't delay. You may not even have tomorrow. Today could be your last day. Please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess with your mouth He is the Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the grave. And the Bible says you will be saved. Well, this has been Billy Crone of Get Life Ministries. If there's anything that we could do for you, our information and, and number will come up here shortly. And please don't hesitate to contact us. But remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless.